Well, thank you for our worship team um, for leading us in, in song and, and praise of our Savior. You know, uh, I think it was last week or may even be the week before, I saw this little picture of that, that uh, Buckingham Palace release of little Prince George on his way to his first day at nursery. I don't know if you've seen that, that little picture. And uh, it reminded me actually of his dad, Prince William, and his first day um, going off to, to nursery school. And you see that uh, whether it's George or, or William or even uh, Prince Charles, uh, they really didn't have any say in which family they were to be born into. Uh, that was just what happened. Uh, they were born into the royal family, and therefore, whether they like it or not, they need to conform to the practices and the ways of the royal family. And uh, a prince in a, in a royal family, from the day he's born, or a princess for that matter, uh, they are basically groomed and uh, prepared. They are trained and educated uh, so that they would learn how to walk and how to talk and how to act and interact with others in a way that befits their station in life which is, of course, royalty. And uh, they need to conform to certain acceptable standards. And, and nothing is left to chance, really. They are pretty well groomed by the time they are ready, or maybe ready, to take on the role of, of, of king. Now, the Bible tells us that uh, those who are Christians, those who are born of God, born again by the Spirit, those who belong to Him, have actually been chosen before the foundation of the earth to be holy and blameless before Him. Uh, the Bible also tells us that uh, those in Christ have been predestined to be adopted as the children of God. And the Bible tells us that those who have so been foreknown and, and predestined, uh, they are to conform to the image of God's Son. We are to conform to, to Christ. Uh, and so that basically happens uh, when we are saved. At, at the time of conversion, we are sanctified. We are set apart. We call that your initial sanctification. It's when you, when you come to salvation, you are set apart, consecrated unto God. And from that day onwards, we are now princes in God's kingdom. We are sons of God, sons and daughters of God. And from that day onward, we are to conform to the image of His Son. We are to conform to the standards which God sets for us to live our lives by. Uh, and that's an ongoing process. Uh, it uh, doesn't stop until the day we passed away. And then the good news for, for Christians is that whatever we lack in holiness, in righteousness, will be supplied for us. And that is called ultimate sanctification. So we have initial sanctification at, at, at salvation. We have progressive sanctification throughout life. And then we have ultimate sanctification. That is when either we pass on to, to be with the Lord, or if the Lord should return, whatever we lack, we will be uh, receiving from Him called glorification or ultimate sanctification. Now, in chapters 1 to 3 in, our, in, in the book under our study, which is Ephesians, we have seen, we have been told who we are. We've been told that we have received much from Christ. Uh, and then from chapters 4 to 6, we are instructed as to how we should walk now in this new calling how we should live as those who have been chosen, who have been predestined to be different, to be distinct, to be holy, to be righteous. And uh, we saw that we need to walk worthy 
of our calling in chapter 4 verse 1 and we need to walk in unity of the spirit and unity of the faith and we need to walk in in holiness and then last week we looked at we need to walk in in love we need to imitate god by walking in love and to imitate god is to uh, and walking in his love is to walk in a forgiving love we need to forgive others just as god in christ forgave us and we need to uh, live a walk in a giving life, uh, a love, a, a sacrificial love, just as Christ gave himself up for us. Uh, that is the example. That is what we ought to walk in as, as Christians. Now we're coming to verses 3 to 7 in chapter 5. Um, and here we see Basically a description that can only be described as an antithesis to walking in love. We are to walk in love by imitating God. But in walking in love we need to shun the world. We should not be partakers with the world in their ways any longer. And so let me read for us. I'll I'll read from um, verse 1 for us in Ephesians chapter 5. If you're there, please follow along. Therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints." And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And so Paul is here admonishing the Ephesian believers uh, to cast away their old sinful ways. And he tells them to call to mind the truth that they know. And he calls them to choose to have no part with the ways of the world any longer. Uh, So if we are to walk in love, we need to follow Christ's example in forgiving love, in sacrificial love. But at the same time, we need to cast away these things, these practices, these evil uh, practices that Paul describes here. And he basically describes for us six here. Uh, Three had to do with deeds and three to do with our speech. And so first of all, he says, cast away all these evil deeds, immorality, impurity, greed. And these all three stands diametrically opposed to the practices of Christian love. These are actions that would be more suited for those who are self-indulgent, self-satisfying, self-focused, not those who who walk in a self-sacrificial love as Christ did. And Paul felt it necessary to address these evil practices for the Ephesian church were made up of predominantly Gentile believers. And they came from a very pagan culture. They were saved out of a very pagan culture. The, the Greco-Roman times of the first century uh, was marked by a distinct, uh, uh, well, an indifference really uh, to uh, sexual immorality. Uh, immorality was rife in that society and it seems like everyone from the masses to the most distinguished persons were freely and openly indulging themselves in all kinds of illicit sexual activities without any shame or scruples and Paul Paul actually hinted to this back in chapter 4 when he referred to the Gentiles and he called them not to to walk in the ways uh, uh, of the Gentiles, uh, those who have, uh, through, through their futility of mind, their hardness of heart, their separation from God, have actually given themselves over to a sensuality and for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Uh, 
And so this was the cultural background that the Ephesian believers came out of. And Paul was reminding them that if you are to walk in love, if you who are called to be holy and blameless, you are who have been created in the likeness of God, in righteousness and holiness of the truth, this behavior cannot and must not be part of your life any longer. And so cast these practices away from you. Talks about immorality. Immorality is the Greek word pornos, from which we get the word pornography. And though we live in times where we live in times where it's virtually impossible to escape uh, pornographic images, uh, I think what is meant here is more than just looking at pornographic pictures. Although it certainly includes that as well. But here the word speaks of sexual immorality. Uh, fornication is oftentimes translated in the older uh, Bible translations. and basically refers to, to sex outside the bounds of marriage. Marriage, that is, as God gave it and God defined it. And so immorality would include any illegitimate sexual intercourse, any illicit clandestine or covert relationship such as adultery or premarital sex. And so Paul says, cast immorality away from you. And also impurity, that's the next one on the list. Impurity is often mentioned together with sexual immorality, indicating that that is what uh, makes someone impure. Uh, is when they engage in illicit sexual conduct. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 reminds us, For this is the will of God for you, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. And then in verse 4, that's, uh, rather verse 7 of that same chapter, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. And so impurity would include all the, the illicit sexual activities for, uh, uh, encapsulated or defined by immorality, but it goes beyond that. It would include practices like homosexuality and even sex with prostitutes. You see, visiting prostitutes was common in those days. It's part of the pagan uh, set of worship. In fact, I think in Athens, there's a temple, the temple to the goddess Aphrodite, uh, was built by the prophets of these brothels, really. Uh, the activities of, of visiting prostitutes as, a, as part of their pagan worship. And these activities defiles a person. And it's a particularly heinous sin for a Christian to be involved in. Because although it may have been acceptable for them in their society... Uh, as not unlike probably in our society, uh, it is in particularly a reprehensible sin for a Christian who has been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul actually addressed this very practice when he says in verse 16, Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And so Paul is saying, cast away impurity. Uh, actually, it says any impurity or all impurity, and that would include other activities, any activity that would render you spiritually unclean. So cast those deeds away from you. Uh, the next thing Paul mentioned was greediness. Now, they would say normally that the, the two big evils in any society would be lust and greed. Uh, and certainly Paul has mentioned lust now, now he turns to greed. Those who walk in love cannot, ought not to be characterized by greed or covetousness. Because greed or greediness is 
selfishness. It epitomizes selfishness. It is always self-focused and it's never satisfied. It always wants more, more possessions, more money, more for the sake of having more. And Jesus warned us that we cannot serve two masters because you will either love the one or and hate the other one. Because you cannot serve both God and mammon in Matthew 6, 24. And, but covetousness is, is not restricted to material possessions or, or money. It, it can be anything. Uh, it can be status. It can be fame. And here in our context, where greediness is, is, is linked with immorality and impurity, it probably has a, uh, a, a reference to, 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 to greed of a sexual nature. It's an insatiable desire for more, more sexual encounters, different sexual partners, different sexual experiences, all with self-gratification as the main and primary focus. And so Paul recognized the danger that these practices holds for the believer, especially for one who once walked in these ways, who was saved out from them. And uh, he's saying that these sins are serious, these sins are vile and, and contrary to the way of Christian love. And they should not only be cast away from you, but they should not even be mentioned among you among you as is proper among saints. Don't even talk about these things. This is inappropriate. It's inappropriate to speak about these things in the, in, in, in the, in the presence of those who are holy, who are called to be holy and blameless. Saints, and I think Paul used this word saints deliberately to emphasize their saints, their, their standing in the Lord because saints basically means holy ones. They are the ones who are in Christ set apart. They are sanctified. They are purified. They should be distinct and different other than what the world is. And so immorality, impurity, greed are not the deeds of associated with selfless love, but with those who are selfish. And they should not be found among those who are seeking to imitate God. In fact, they should not even be mentioned. And Paul then goes on after addressing their deeds, went on to speech. Verse 4 says, There must be no filthiness, silly talk, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And so all these three, filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, all three speaks of a, of a dirty mind, uh, of an impure heart. Uh, you remember that the mouth is the window to the heart, and from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Luke 6.45 tells us. And so filthiness would be any shameful language, obscenities, profanities, those who have a, a potty mouth, uh, those who would use indecent language, improper language, vile language, obscene language. But I think it, it covers more than just words. It includes any thought, any imagination, any desire, any word or deed that when it is exposed to the light will bring shame on that person. And so Paul says, cast that away from you. you. You have a new heart. You have a cleansed heart. You have a heart filled with the love of Christ, full with the love for things that are now pure and holy and right and lovely and honorable and excellent and praiseworthy. That is what your heart should be filled and that's what should flow out of your mouth, not this filth. Filthiness is the last thing that should come out of the mouth of someone whose heart has been touched by grace. It should not be part of the Christian vocabulary. Someone who calls or claims to follow God, that is the holy God of the Bible. So cast filthiness aside, cast silly talk uh, I love the Greek language. It's, it's so ex expressive. 
Uh, silly talk actually means moro logoia, which means moro from which we get moron, and logia, which we get logos, words. And so it stops speaking moronic words, really, is the direct translation. And this is not talking about intellectual ability. This is talking about a lack of moral discernment. It's foolish talk uh, that is in mind here. It is saying things for the sake of drawing attention uh, to be funny, not thinking what you are saying, and often veering uh, way off from what is acceptable. And we know that Psalm 14.1 tells us that it, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So foolishness would be talk that excludes God from the picture, that does not take into account his will or his ways. It's speaking of things or about things as if God is not present or as if he did not reveal his standards to us. This is foolish talk, silly talk. That needs to be cast away. Coarse jesting is the third one he mentions here. And I think this one is actually pretty far-reaching. Uh, I believe it's, that's more in mind than just the telling of, of off-color jokes. Uh, the word literally means one that turns easily. And it's only used once in the Bible here. And, but from its used in classical Greek, we, we find that it's referred to someone who's quick-witted. Someone who's able to turn a conversation with ease. Uh, someone who can think on their feet. Someone who always have a, a comeback. Uh, well, you know if, if you are such a person or you may know such a person. Someone who's always just very sharp, very very uh, able to, to turn a phrase very quickly or to turn the conversation for the sake of humor or fun. They are normally good conversationists and, and very socially adept. But the idea here is, is that this ability is used in a sinful manner. And so it refers to someone who can easily turn a, a, a sound conversation, a edifying conversation with the right anecdote or a subtle innuendo or the sudden remembrance of a, of a story and turn the discussion or the, the conversation to, to more baser things, more, more sensual things, maybe even more perverse things. Um, they would love the use of double meanings in words, word plays, sort of, or clever questions that they may throw in in a conversation, or even uh, present a plausible deduction to whatever has been discussed playing sort of the devil's advocate, but all with the intent of manipulating the conversation or the discussion to go where they want to go, want it to go, and in the context, it is more towards the sensual, to the lustful, to the base, and to the profane. So coarse jesting suggests all of that. They are those who have a, sort of a, a rubbish dump for a mind and a quick ability to steer the conversation to that tip away from what is edifying and meaningful and spiritually enriching and Paul says this kind of speech is evil and it's not fitting it is inappropriate conduct of a son or a daughter of God it's inappropriate speech and so instead of being engaged with that, if you, if you open your mouth, let it be in the giving of thanks, not in speaking filth or silly talk or coarse jesting, but rather we should be giving thanks. That should be the overriding attitude of our hearts. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving must be synonymous with the Christian life because it's the only appropriate response to the amazing grace we've received. And we, are, we have much to give thanks for. I mean, I appreciate the prayers this morning, giving thanks for what we have. I mean, even in our study of, this, of God's Word, we see in chapter 1 um, just the Im immense spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. 
And we should be able to give thanks for that. If, our, if we have to speak, let our mouth overflow with thanksgiving for these spiritual blessings. Let our mouth overflow with thanksgiving for those whom the Lord has reconciled unto us, being part of us in the body of Christ, those brothers and sisters whom the Lord has given us. Let's give thanks for that. And so we need to give thanks for spiritual blessings, but also physical blessings. Because we know that God our Father is... Uh, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And so if we, if we take this into the context of our passage again, uh, a thankful heart would recognize that even sex is a gift from God and should be enjoyed and celebrated in ways that brings Him glory and Him honor, not in selfish, degrading and defiling ways. And also a thankful heart acknowledges that God is the one who abundantly supplies all our needs. And therefore we can readily, easily, willingly use our possessions to bless others. See, where there's greed, generosity is normally absent. Or vice versa, when someone is generous, greed is normally absent. And Paul is saying, cast these old ways, these sinful ways, the ways of the world, away from you. Uh, I think our, our society is, is probably increasingly becoming more and more pagan. Uh, and uh, one of the measures to determine that is the indifferent attitude to sexual immorality that is evidenced in our society today. Uh, and there may be even many of us here whom the Lord has graciously saved who once walked in these pagan ways uh, but who now have been touched by God's grace and been filled with His love Uh, and we are called to walk in that love to imitate God and to part of doing that is so that is the putting on imitating God Walking in love and the putting off is is to cast away the ways, the sinful ways of the world. But Paul goes further. He tells them, he admonished them to call to mind the truth that they know. That they know. Verse 5 reads, For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or a covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And what he's saying is, is there is no future in sin. Those who are characterized by these evil practices, there is no future for them. They have no inheritance. And he goes on, he starts off, he says, you know this with certainty. It's, it's, it's actually in the Greek a very emphatic expression. Paul is almost chastising them. He said, you know this. I know you know this. This is not new to you. Because he uses, he uses two words in the Greek. One that refers to, to, to gaining knowledge through reflection and thinking. It's a more intellectual understanding or knowledge of something. And then he uses another word as well, ginosko, which refers to knowing something through your senses, through experiencing it. It's a more practical, experiential knowledge. It's like, um, uh, I know about Fiji. Why? Because I read about it. But I would love to really know Fiji by visiting it. Just a secret little desire of mine. Uh, But uh, Paul is saying here, cast these evil practices away from you. Uh, Because you know the truth. You know that those who are involved in this, those who are characterized by this, no immoral person, no impure person, no covetous person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. And this doesn't mean that when you have fallen into the sin uh, by the odd occasion, 
that therefore now you have lost all inheritance. That's not what Paul means. He's saying here that it is those who are still willfully continue on in this, insistently continuing on with this lifestyle and have not repented of that, have not turned away from their immorality, their impurity, and their greed. He says, because those who are marked by that, they are idolaters. And idolatry is placing any object or person ahead or above or before Christ. And choosing to live in this way amounts to idolatry. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 tells us, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He says, you know this. You know this. That... Those who practice these things have no inheritance. They are not part of the kingdom of God and Christ. Actually, it's a, it's a very interesting phrase he says, because he says they, they have no uh, inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, you don't see this in the, in, the, in the English so much, but in the Greek, that actually links Christ with God. It makes Christ equal with God. And it's one of the many verses in Ephesians that can be used to, to, to uh, uh, support the deity of Christ. That Christ is in fact God and therefore by definition support the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And so the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God is the same kingdom. But if you have to draw a distinction between the two, Paul uses the kingdom of God to sometimes more ref refer to a future aspect of God's kingdom, that which is yet to come. Uh, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So therefore we need to be changed. We need to receive new glorified bodies in order to inherit the kingdom of God, the future kingdom of God. But he also uses the kingdom of Christ to refer to the kingdom of God that is right now, right among us and in us. Uh, Colossians 1.13 tells us that we have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. And so where Christ is and where His grace is, there is His kingdom. And the wonderful truth is, is that a believer is not admitted to the kingdom of God as a subject. We are admitted to the kingdom of God as an heir, an, an heir of God and a an fellow heir of Christ. We have the kingdom now, but we will have it fully. We are princes in God's kingdom now, but when we overcome... We will sit with him on the throne, as Revelation 3.21 reminds us. And he says, so those who are adulterers, uh, not adulterers, idolaters, those who remain in their idolatrous state until their dying day, or the, when the Lord returns, the immoral, impure, the greedy, they have no inheritance. There's no future for those who remain in their sin. And they have no part of God's kingdom, either now or in the future. And so they have no, there's no future in sin, and there is no escape from God's judgment. Verse 6 reads, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. If you claim to love God, if you claim to be walking with God, if you claim to know Christ and to be in Him while walking in immorality, while walking in impurity, while walking in greed, that is a lie. You are living a lie. You are deceived. And people, our hearts are deceitful above all else. 
and desperately wicked, desperately sick. We are so susceptible to deception. Jeremiah 79 tells us. And Paul warns us in, a, in the Colossians that um, we should make sure that no one takes us captive with, with, uh, through philosophy or empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. He's saying don't fall for the worldly wisdom of those who are excusing their worldly ways. Let no one deceives you. And Paul is, is, is not only Paul who, who uh, warns against this. John, the Apostle John does so as well in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. How did Christ walk? He walked in love. Sacrificial, giving love. And then here in our passage, in verses 1 and 2, we are reminded that we need to imitate God by walking in love and to shun immorality, greed, and impurity. And he says here, let, don't let anyone persuade you otherwise. With their, with their empty words, their words that may sound wise, may sound positive, may sound caring, may sound even loving, but words that are void of the truth, words that are authored by the father of lies and not by the spirit of truth. And so the question for us is, who are these deceivers? Who may they be? Um, I think there are, there are two groups really who may deceive us in thinking that this lifestyle of immorality, impurity, and greed is acceptable. First of all, there are those who are outside, those who are not in Christ. They who have not bowed the knee before Him. They who live without reference to God and without reverence to Him. And they speak loudest to us today through our media, through entertainment. Uh, they are, in, in, we live in a world where the entertainment media has access to virtually every house on the planet. And their voice is overpowering. And over the years, immorality and impurity and greed have been subtly and occasionally introduced into the programming that was aired. But now these vices are blatantly and incessantly portrayed to us as innocent, fun, perfectly acceptable. And so through humorous sitcoms, through daring movies, and through, I would say, probably meticulously casted reality shows, this is what is portrayed for us. This is, this is, there's nothing wrong with this. Everybody's doing it. Don't be such a square. And so their voice speaks to us and they declare to us what once was good is now evil and once was evil is now good. But it's easy for us to recognize the outsiders. I think there's also the insiders, which is a much bigger problem. Those who, who walk among us, uh, Jesus calls them the tares among the wheat. Those who are dressed in sheep's clothing, but in fact they are ravenous wolves. Those who seek to justify their behavior by excusing the behavior of others. By even endorsing the immorality of others. I'm thinking, I think I've heard of, of uh, I need to be careful what I'm saying, but I heard of, 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 uh, youth pastors uh, advocating that sex before marriage is perfectly fine because you need to you need to make sure 
she's the right one or he's the right one. Uh, those who celebrate the ones who come out of the closet declaring their homosexual tendencies and behavior as brave and do not condemn the behavior for what it is as sin and then try to reinterpret the Bible to support their position. They are the insiders that we as a church need to be careful of. Those that will be the, in regards to immorality, those who, who fleece God's people through their health and wealth gospel. This is, this is which is really no other gospel really. Uh, they are the ones who, who deceive people by, if you want more, give more. But their lust is money. They want more. And they want you to want more. And so it becomes this cycle. And I'm sure there are many others that you can think of and identify that we need to be careful of that, will, that may end up deceiving us or maybe just change our thinking a little bit about these things. But Paul says, you know that they have no inheritance of God uh, in, in God's kingdom, and you know that there's only one thing await for them, and that is judgment. That is the wrath of God. And it says there that, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, the wrath of God is both an eschatological aspect to it, that is a future wrath, that is when Christ returns, and we read in, in Revelation 19 that, that he will pour out and tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. There is a future aspect of his right. But th there's also a present aspect of God's wrath that is, that is often overlooked. And that is that his wrath is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. This is a wrath that involves giving the sinner over to their sin, allowing the full consequences of their sin to come upon them. And I can tell you it is a dreadful and fearful thing if God gives someone over to be consumed by their own sin. And we have read that passage this morning. Uh, Romans 1 verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. You want to be impure? Well, go ahead. Be impure. Verse 26, and for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of women and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. You don't want me, then go. Follow after your sin. I'll give you over to your degrading passions. Verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind, to those things which are not proper. And then he lists them. Unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Isn't that a description of our times <laughs> in many ways? Where sin is seeming to increase daily. The question is, when does God do that? When does he hand someone over to their sins? I think that's actually the wrong question to ask. Uh, because when we ask that question, we may be tempted, I think Ben mentioned this morning, to, to actually walk as close as possible to the line of what we can get away with. 
Uh, just so, just before he hands us over, we'll 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 turn away. That so so. When is the wrong qu- uh, uh, question? The question is, is: How can I run as fast as possible, as far as possible, away from this kind of life and closer to my Savior? That's the question we need to ask. And so the Bible does not tell us when God gives someone over to their sins, but it does tell us who will be handed over. Calls them here the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience are those who obviously walk in disobedience. It's on them that the wrath of God will fall. Uh, They are the ones who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They are the ones who do not honor God and give thanks to God. And even in our own book of Ephesians, we've studied in chapter 2, it says they are the, uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. And so the sons of disobedience are those who never turn away from their sin. Who knows, as we just read in Romans 1, they know the ordinances of God, but they refuse to listen. And they give hearty approval for all those who would walk in the same ways that they do. And Paul reminds the Ephesian believers, as he does us today, that should be far from the Son of God, far from those who are princes in the kingdom of God. That should not be even mentioned among us. And so we need to choose to have no part with them. Actually, the, this last verse, the verb there is in the continuous present tense, which means it's ongoing action. We are to be not partakers with them and continue not to be partakers with them. Those who have been made partakers of the promises of Christ, as we read in chapter 3, verse 16, those who are imitators of God and those who are walking in love, they are not to partake in the ways of the world. And so if those, if we find them among us in the church, claiming to be brothers and sisters of us, Scripture tells us to shun them, to avoid them, to not associate with them. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 tells us, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean the, with immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So we cannot flee the world. We can be in the world but not of the world is the message here. And we need to choose that. Uh, Whatever interaction we may have with the world must be out of love the love of Christ in us and the hope that they would turn from their sin. But also it means not to be partakers needs to, we need to be careful about who we choose as partners because that is what that word partakers refer to. It it, it points to a partnership in whether that's possessions or in a relationship. And Scripture is clear that we need to be very careful with whom we partner. Second Corinthians 6 warns us, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? 
Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so we are called to walk in love. And to walk in love means we imitate God and we have to at the same time shun the sinful ways of the world. To cast the old ways away, to call to mind the truth that we know and to choose to have no part with the ways of the world. Let me pray for us. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you have made us your own, that you have adopted us. Lord, for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who have turned from their sin, have bowed their knee before Christ, have confessed their wicked ways, turn away from them, and is following Christ through faith. Lord, those who you have adopted as your own. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of that, for all the spiritual blessings that we have. And, Lord, for the privilege it is to walk in your ways. Lord, that we have been chosen before the foundation of the earth to walk in holiness and to be blameless, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And as such, Lord, to walk in a way that is worthy of that calling. And Father, so I pray that you would help us, Lord, that if we are tempted by the world, that we would shun that. Lord, that if we have entered into partnership with the world, that we would undo that. And Lord, that we would set all our affection our love, our desires on you to please you, to honor you in the ways that we live. And that is to walk in love, Lord, and to shun the ways of the world. And so we pray, help us in that in Jesus' name.